In this video, we'll discuss the extreme value theorem as it applies to functions of several variables. We'll start by reviewing the definitions of absolute and relative extrema from Calculus 1, and we'll talk about the extreme value theorem from Calculus 1. And then we'll extend that to functions of several variables and work a Calculus 3 example. Um, so let's just review what absolute extrema are. Um, whenever someone uses the word absolute extrema, that is basically interchangeable with absolute or global minima. If, they're, if it's singular, it's just a minimum. And absolute or global um, maxima. If it's singular, it's a maximum. You know, I'm emphasizing the wrong syllable, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, so, more formally, we'll say that f of x naught is an absolute max, absolute or global max, if the following is true. If all of the other y values are less than or equal to that y value, this is an absolute max on an interval. So I guess I should qualify that. We'll say an absolute max on an interval i. If f of x is less than or equal to f of x naught for all x in the interval i, that little epsilon there just means that x is in this interval. And we call um, f of x naught an absolute min if it's the smallest y value on the interval. So all of the other y values, this is a particular y value, all the other y values are greater than or equal to that value. This is an absolute min on the interval i. If this is true for all x in the interval, and we've already discussed what relative extrema are. Um, those are the smallest, um, the absolute, or the relative minimum, excuse me, the relative maximum is the uh, largest y value in some neighborhood, and a relative minimum is the smallest y value in some neighborhood. So let's look at a function and identify absolute mins relative mins, absolute maxes, and relative maxes. So maybe our function looks like this. Well, um, it looks like I've got a lot going on here. It looks like at x equals a, we've got the absolute max. That's the largest y value over here. It, the absolute maximum is actually the y value y max right there, um, but it occurs at x equals a. So you have an absolute max and it occurs at x equals a. And it looks like we've got an absolute min as well. That looks like the smallest y value. So y min is our absolute min, and it occurs at this x value. I'm just going to call it x1. And over here, it looks like we've got an absolute max, or excuse me, a relative max, whatever that y value is, that occurs at x2. And here, 
that y value occurs at x sub 3. That's a relative min because it's the smallest y value nearby. Then over here, I'll call that x sub 4. We've got another relative max. It's the small or the largest y value in the neighborhood. And then over here at this x value, which I will label x sub 5, we've got another min, a relative min. And then at x equals b, we've got a relative max. Well, maybe not. Maybe that's the max, and then the actually at x equals b, it's a relative min. So I'll call this x sub 6. We've got a max. And then at x equals b, it sort of decreases just a little bit. We've got another relative min. Okay, so again, relative um, mins and maxes are the, uh, the re uh, relative maximum, excuse me, is the largest y value in some neighborhood. So this is the largest y value in a little neighborhood around x equals a. This is the largest y value, this is the largest y value, and that's the largest y value. So our relative maxima occur at all of these points and x equals a. And then the relative mins are the smallest y values in a neighborhood. So we've got a min here at x1, we've got a min at x3, we've got a min at x sub 5. Um, and then we have a relative min at x equals b because it decreases just a little bit to get to b. Okay, so those are our relative mins. Now we also have absolute and or at an absolute max and an absolute min for this particular function. The largest y value is that y value right there, which I've labeled y max. And the smallest y value is that y value right there, which I've labeled y min. Um, so that is, that's the definition of an absolute max and an absolute min and a review of relative mins and maxes. <coughs> Now, in Calculus 1, you learned something called the Extreme Value Theorem. If you have a function on an interval, you're not always guaranteed to have an absolute max or an absolute min. A couple of conditions are required in order for us to, to guarantee that we get an absolute max or an absolute min. See, Extreme Value Theorem says that if f is continuous, so it has to be continuous, on a closed interval from A to B, so an interval including the endpoints, then we're guaranteed that F has an absolute max. On that interval, and F has an absolute min on that interval. Now, there are lots of ways that that could happen. If you have a closed interval from A to B, it's possible that the function is decreasing the whole time. Well, I didn't do a very good job of showing it decreasing the whole time. Um, let me draw it again. It's possible our function is decreasing the whole time. it's possible our function is increasing the whole time. So here we've got, um, this one's decreasing. You've got an absolute max right here at x equals a, and you've got an absolute min right there. Here we've got an absolute min at A, and you have an absolute max at B. Now, don't get me wrong, x equals A and x equals B, those are the locations of the absolute max and absolute min. The actual absolute minimum is the y value that goes with that x value. 
So those are the absolute mins. Here's the absolute max. It's the y value that goes with that x value. So that's a possibility. If you have a continuous function on a closed interval and it's decreasing or increasing, um, the absolute max and the absolute min will occur at the endpoints. Now another possibility is you've got something like this where maybe the minimum minimum value occurs on the interior at this x value which I'll call x1 and the maximum occurs over here at x equals a so we'll have an absolute max at x equals a and the absolute min occurs at x1 on the interior another possibility is you could have um, a min, the absolute min on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you could have an absolute min on one of the endpoints and an absolute max on the interior. So maybe it looks like this. Our absolute min occurs at x equals a, and our absolute max, well it's that y value right there, it occurs at this x value, which I'll call x1. So we could have our absolute extrema at the endpoints. We could have the absolute extrema at one endpoint and at one interior point, like we have here. It's also possible that your absolute max and your absolute min both occur on the interior. I had a little sleepy from my eye and I put it on the paper, sorry. So maybe your graph looks like this. The absolute max, it's that y value. And it occurs at x1. And the absolute min, it's the smallest y value that occurs at x2. So you can have absolute extrema on either endpoint. You can have absolute extrema entirely on the interior, or you can have absolute extrema on an endpoint and on the interior. Um, but the extreme value theorem says, as long as f is continuous on this closed interval from a to b, then f is guaranteed an absolute max and an absolute min on that interval. Now notice where those those um, absolute maxes and absolute mins could happen either on the endpoints or on the interior. But if it happens on the interior, let's look at it. Well, if it happens on the interior, notice that absolute min corresponds to a point where the derivative is zero. Or this absolute max, it corresponds to a point where the derivative is zero. This absolute max and this absolute min, they both correspond to points where the derivative is zero. Now I didn't show you one of these yet, but I probably should. If I have a, a function like this, well I've got a, oops, that's a relative max, or excuse me, a relative min. This is the absolute min, it occurs at x equals a. So absolute min at x equals a, a relative min, because it's the smallest y value nearby, at x equals b. And then at this x value, the derivative is undefined, but that's where the absolute max is. It's so the absolute max occurs at x equals x1. Okay, so um, extreme value theorem does not tell you how to find the absolute extrema, but looking at these pictures, we can kind of see what's going on. Um, the absolute extrema either occur at the endpoints, as we've seen, or they occur at critical points that are on the interior of the interval. So we've got critical points due to having a horizontal tangent line. So the slope is zero there and there and there and there or we could have critical points due to the derivative being undefined. Um, and then in calculus in one, you actually did this for a number of functions. You determined the absolute extrema by finding the critical points on the interval 
finding the corresponding y values, finding the y values at the ends, and then saying, okay, which one's the largest y value? That's your absolute max. Which one's the smallest y value? That's your absolute min. So you did all of that. We're gonna do the same thing in calculus three, but it's a little bit more involved now. When we're, uh, when we're testing the function on like the sort of endpoints of the interval, like we only had two values in calculus one. I only had to find the y value at x equals a and x equals b because we were working with a function of one variable. Now in calculus three, you're talking about functions of x and y defined on regions r. So let me give you the extreme value theorem for calculus three. I'm writing it as extreme value theorem for multivariable functions, but we're just focused on a function of two variables, z equals f of x, y. I bet you can guess what this says. Knowing what we just discussed about the extreme value theorem in calculus one, I bet you know what the extreme value theorem should be for calculus three. Well, I hope you know. So we'll say, if the function f of x, y is continuous on a closed let's say bounded region R, then f is guaranteed to have an absolute max on the region R and I don't believe it says is guaranteed to but that's how I think of it f is guaranteed to have an absolute max on R and an absolute min on R now this is an existence theorem, a lot like the intermediate value theorem. It doesn't tell us how to find um, the absolute extrema, but it does tell us that if f is continuous on that closed bounded interval, then we're guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute min. Um, so let's talk about how we can find um, the relative, or excuse me, the absolute extrema um, in calculus three. We're basically doing the same thing that we did in calculus one, it's just a little bit more involved. The first thing you need to do is find the critical points of the function that lie in the region R. And I typically, in this point, focus on the interior of R. So not the boundary. And once you find those critical points, you want to f evaluate the function there. You want to find the corresponding z value to each critical value. So I'll just call it z naught equals f of x naught y naught, where x naught y naught is a critical point. Then you need to um, find the critical points of f on the boundary. So you want to optimize your function on the boundary of r.
Now this is not as easy as it was in Calculus 1 because in Calculus 1 you just had to check the y value at x equals a and x equals b. You just plugged in a couple of values and you immediately had two to, to put on your list. Um, but now when we're looking at a boundary of a region, remember this is a function of two variables. We've got some surface up here and maybe this is our region R down here. And we're just looking for the absolute max and the absolute min of um, this function, so the absolute minimum z value and the absolute maximum z value over this region. Well, now instead of evaluating the function at a point like x equals a and x equals b, the boundary is a curve. So it's a little bit more involved. So you're going to have to optimize f on the boundary. Um, usually there are multiple curves. So usually we're focusing on each curve on the boundary. And then you evaluate the function um, at each of those critical points. So you're going to find mins and maxes of the function on the, on the boundary, and then the absolute max of those, you're going to write it down. And you'll find the absolute min of those, and you'll write it down. Um, So we'll find the corresponding z values. For each, I'm going to call them critical points, even though they're not exactly critical points um, as we defined them earlier. They're going to be critical points, but only on the restriction of, the, on, of that, that function on the boundary. Then the largest z value is your absolute max, and the smallest z value is your absolute min. That's it. It's actually pretty simple. Okay, now that's the plan. Let's apply it to a function. So here's our function. I have f of xy equals 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y, and our region r is a set of all xy pairs in R2 such that uh, y squared, or excuse me, x squared is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 4. Okay. So I've got this polynomial function. I actually don't know what it looks like, so I'm just going to draw my typical cartoon of a function. So it's up here somewhere. And it might go through the xy plane. We don't really know. It's just a cartoon, just to, to give us some sense of what's going on. Um, we want to find the absolute extrema of this function over this region. Now this region is described this way. They're telling us we want all of the xy pairs such that the y values in those xy y pairs are in between x squared and 4. So to sketch this region, I'm going to sketch two curves, y equals x squared and y equals 4. And I want all the y values in between. So y equals 4 is right here. And y equals x squared looks like this. That's our region R. So our first job is to find any relative extrema, or excuse me, find any critical points of our function on the interior of R.
And then once we found those, we'll find the z values there. And then we'll take our function and we'll optimize it along this part of the uh, line y equals 4. We've got y equals 4 for x between negative 2 and 2. And we'll also optimize this function along the curve uh, y equals x squared for x between negative 2 and 2. Um, once we find the absolute max and absolute min of this function on this line segment and this line or on this curve, um, well, we're going to find z values for each of those. We just compare all the z values on our list. Um, so that's the plan. Let's do it. First, let's find the critical values. And then see if there are any that actually lie in that region. I'm saying critical values, but really we're in Calc 3. So I should really think of them as critical points, because they are x, y coordinates. And remember how we do that. We compute the gradient, set the gradient vector equal to 0, and solve for x, y. OK, that's the plan. So f of x, y is 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. And I'll find the partial with respect to x first. Well, there's only one x term. The derivative of this with respect to x is just 6x. And I've got um, the derivative of that with respect to x is 0. The derivative of that with respect to x is 0. Partial of f with respect to y. Well, there's no y's in that, so that's a constant with respect to y. So the derivative of that part is 0. Derivative of this part with respect to y is 4y. And the derivative of this part with respect to y is negative 4. So we're setting the gradient, that's this vector, equal to 0. And that's equivalent to saying, I need the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y to equal 0 at the same time. Now this is actually a really simple one. Um, 6x equals 0 when x equals 0. Oh, I wrote 6, but when x equals 0. And 4y minus 4 equals 0 when 4y equals 4, divide both sides by 4, that means y equals 1. Is the point x equals 0, y equals 1 in our region? It sure is, it's right there. So we need to find the z value at that point. Um, okay, so we found the critical uh, points of the function. We identify the critical points that are inside R. And now we need to evaluate the function there. So we're evaluating each or F at each critical point in the interior of R. Okay, so the z value at x equals 0, y equals 1 is 3 times 0 squared plus 2 times 1 squared minus 4 times 1. So you have 0 and then 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So that is one potential um, z value for our absolute max, absolute min list. Now we want to keep going. So remember our function is 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. And we're on this region, 
we were told that we want all the, or the region R is the set of all xy pairs such that y is in between x squared and 4. y equals 4 is here, y equals x squared is here. Not to scale. And we want to optimize our function f of x, y on each of these curves. We just have two curves that we have to worry about. Now if you're saying to yourself, how did you know to shade in between? Well, remember, I need the y's to be greater than x squared, so they need to be above the curve y equals x squared, above the parabola, and below that horizontal line y equals 4. So that's the, that's the region. And we found a critical value at x equals 0, y equals 1. And so we're making a list of z values. Say possible absolute extrema. So far we've got one possibility. That's z equals f of 0, 1, which happened to be negative 2. That's one possibility. Now we want to optimize this function on this curve and this curve. I think I'll just optimize on, on y equals 4 first because that's easier. I'll call this curve number 1 and I'll call this one curve number 2. It's not much curving on curve number 1 but that's cool. It's just a special case. On curve number 1 we have y equals 4. Um, and x goes from negative 2 to 2. We want to optimize this function along that um, line segment. So we just evaluate the function f of x at y equals 4, or f of x y at y equals 4. So we have 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4 times, I wrote x up here, I don't know why I did that, 4 times y, and y equals 4. So this ends up being 3x squared plus um, 32 minus 16, that's going to be 16. And so now I've got a function of a single variable. And it's a function of a single variable on a closed interval. So I could have just as easily written this this way in interval notation from negative 2 to 2. So now I can optimize this function, this function of x on the interval from negative 2 to 2 using the extreme value theorem from calculus 1. So I've got f of x and 4 is equal to this. Well, in order to find a relative extrema of this function on this interval, the first thing I would do is take the derivative with respect to x. So I'm going to use prime notation now. There's only one variable. It's a derivative. It's so that's an ordinary derivative with respect to x, and we get six x. Now, that um, in order to find the critical values of x on this interval from negative two to two, we always take the derivative, set the derivative equal to equal to zero and then solve for x. So that means x equals 0. And then we evaluate the function there. So we've got f of 0 and 4. If x is 0 and y is 4, we just get 16. So that's the z value there. Okay, that's a possibility. Now, another possible extreme value of the function occurs at the endpoints of the interval. We have to test x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. So you evaluate f at 2 and positive 2, or excuse me, negative 2 and positive 2. This particular version of f where we're restricted to the line segment where y equals 4. And see what you get. Well, this was our function, when x equals plus or minus 2, I think we're going to get the same value. 
So I've got uh, 4 times 3, so that's 12. And 12 plus 16 is 28. And negative 2 squared is also 4, so we'll also get 28. Okay, so those are possible extrema. So we're good there. Uh, now we want to um, optimize our function f of x, y on this curve where y is equal to x squared. But again, we're restricted to the interval from negative 2 to 2. So on curve number 2, we have y equals x squared, and x is between negative 2 and 2. I think I'm just going to use this, this notation instead. OK. So we're replacing all of our y's with x squared. So we have f of x and y was 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4 times y. But y is equal to x squared, so we're making a substitution. We've got that now. So we simplify. x squared squared, you multiply the exponents. That's an x to the fourth. Collect like terms. 3x squared, if I take four of them away, I'm down one. I have negative 1x squared left. OK, so this is our function. It's a function of x now. Um, and we're on the interval from negative 2 to 2. So it's a closed interval. The function is continuous on that interval, so we'll use the extreme value, value theorem from calculus 1. Um, so I'll take the derivative of this function. I'm not 100% sure about this notation. This is the notation I've been using. Um, it's, just, it's just a little iffy. Um, but I'm thinking of it as a function of one variable, so now I'll use prime notation. So if I want the critical points of this function on this interval, the first thing I do is I take the derivative. I get negative 2x plus 8x cubed. And then we set that derivative equal to 0 and solve for x. So I would factor out a 2x. So 2x times negative 1 gives me that first term and 2x times 4x squared would give me my second term. And the only way that happens is if this factor equals 0 or if this factor equals 0. I may have skipped the step where I said set that equal to 0. So we factor, and then we say this times this equals 0 if this equals 0 or this equals 0. Sometimes I'm thinking a couple steps ahead of myself and I forget to say it out loud which could be a bad thing sorry guys so 2x equals 0 when x equals 0 that's one possibility or 4x squared minus 1 equals 0 which means 4x squared equals 1 which means x squared equals 1 fourth which means x squared could be plus or minus the square root of 1 fourth which is plus or minus square root of 1 over square root of 4 which is 1 half Okay, so we've got possible um, extrema at x equals 0 and x equals plus or minus 1 half. Okay, so we're going to substitute those values into this function. So when x is 0, we get 0 and 0 squared there, which is 0. And then if x is 0, that's just going to be negative 0 squared plus 2 times 0 to the 4th, which is, of course, 0. So that is a possibility for absolute extrema. f of 0, 0 is on the list. The other possibilities come from setting x equal to plus and minus 1 half. If x equals 1 half, x squared equals 1 fourth. If x equals negative 1 half, a negative 1 half times a negative 1 half 
is negative one half squared. That's positive one fourth as well. Um, we're substituting into this function. So I have negative one half quantity squared plus two times one half to the fourth. One half to the fourth is one sixteenth. One sixteenth times two is one eighth. Um, this is one eighth minus one fourth. So that's uh, one eighth minus two eighths. So that's negative one eighth. And then because of symmetry, I've got this squared and that to the fourth. Since those are even powers, we're gonna get negative one eighth for these guys as well, or for this point as well. So that's that. Z equals, oops, F of one half and one fourth is negative one eighth, and Z equals F of negative one half and one fourth is negative one eighth. Now typically I would test the endpoints of this as well. When x equals negative two, I get negative two four. When x equals positive two, I get positive two four, but we've already tested those endpoints. The endpoints of curve number two are the same as the endpoints of curve number one. So those are already on the list. There's no need to find those again. Okay, so after you have optimized your function, on each curve on the boundary, and you have found the critical points on the interior and found the z values that correspond to that critical point, there only happened to be one this time, you look at your list, you look at all those z values. The largest z value on the list is the absolute max. It looks like it's 28, it actually occurs twice. So we have an absolute max of 28. The maximum value is always the value of the dependent variable. So it's the value of z in this case. So it's absolute max of 28, and it occurs at a certain location. So there's a function that's well-defined um, above this region in the xy plane. So let's look at this like this. Here's the positive y-axis, and we've got a parabola over here, and here's y equals four talking about that region. And actually we're including the boundary because that's what's required for our extreme value theorem. There's some function over here. Well, it, it, happened, it just so happens that at this point and this point, the z values on that function are 28. So we have an absolute max of 28 and it occurs at x equals 2y equals 4 and x equals negative 2y equals 4. It's okay to have um, more than one location for an absolute max. You're only going to have one absolute max because um, it's just a single value. It's the largest value on the list. But your function could take on that value more than one time and that function takes on this value twice at these two points. The absolute min is the smallest value on this list, and it turns out that it occurred at, at 0, 1. So it was right there, and of course this picture is not accurate. That's okay, this is just a cartoon to help us visualize what's going on. It turns out at x equals 0, y equals 1, the z value is negative 2. So that's our absolute min. Okay guys, so that's absolute, or that's finding absolute extrema. Let's recap what we just did. All right, so here is our extreme value theorem for functions of several variables. Um, and actually we're, we're really just talking about functions of two variables, although this generalizes quite nicely um, to n variables. If your function is continuous on a closed bounded region R, so that means the um, boundary is included on the region. Um, that's what makes it closed. Um, and when I say bounded, I mean not the entire xy plane. So like it fits inside a circle, basically. Uh, if you've got a closed bounded region R that looks like this, you're guaranteed to have an absolute max or absolute min on a region that looks like this that's, that's closed um, because it includes a boundary um, and it's bounded, so it fits inside a little circle in the xy-plane. If both of those are true, 
then we're guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute min on R. And this is just a natural extension of what you did in Calculus 1. First, you have to find the critical points that lie in R, and more specifically, in the interior of R. And then you find the z-values there. Then you optimize the function on the boundary of R, and I will just be more specific. You're using the extreme value theorem from Calculus 1 on each of those bounding curves. So you find the critical points on each boundary. Um, you evaluate the function at each of the critical points, so you're getting z values. And then you're going to have some interval. x goes from here to here, or y goes from here to here. Um, you need to plug in those boundary points as well, um, the, you know, the negative 2 and 2 in our example, um, to find where that function is optimized on the boundary, or potentially optimized on the, a boundary. Um, those are like the interesting z-values that might be an absolute max or an absolute min. Then after you've done all of that, you find the largest z-value on your lips or on your list, excuse me. That was a Freudian slip. <laughs> um, the largest z-value on your list is the absolute max, and the smallest z-value on your list is an absolute min. Um, and this was one of our example of how we did it. Hit the critical points, you find the z-value. Then over here, we look at the boundary curves. We describe them. We substitute to get our function as a function of a single variable only on a closed bounded interval. And then we go using the calculus one extreme value theorem. So you find the critical points of this function on this interval, and you evaluate the function at the critical point, or this, this restriction of your function. You evaluate it at the critical point. Then you also evaluate this function at the end points, just like you would in Calculus 1. Add those to the list. Do that for all of the curves. Now, if you've already found a function value, like negative 2, 4, you don't have to do it again. You already know what the, the z value is. Um, so it's not necessary to do that twice. But you're basically trying to find all the potential mins and max along this curve and all the potential mins and maxes along this curve, including those points, and then at any critical points on the interior. And then, like we said, largest z values are the absolute max, and the smallest ones are the absolute min. Now this 16, the 0, the negative 1 eighth, and the negative 1 eighth, those could be um, relative extrema. We might have an absolute or a relative max at 0, 4, or we might have a relative min at, at 0, 0, or a relative min or max at these two um, points. There's not really any way to tell though, um, not with this test. We haven't done the work to determine whether that is a relative min, a relative max, or if it is um, just a saddle point. We, we can't tell. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't do that second partials test. The second partials test would be required in order to determine if these were relative extrema. Um, and since most of these are on the boundary, well, yeah, we, we just don't have to worry about that, that here. Um, so that's it, guys. That's how you find absolute extrema for functions of several variables.